Every day this summer, I have felt so deeply inspired by the passion, by the focus, by the creativity of these amazing innovators. And so I hope that as you hear more about their work and connect with these innovators today, that you also feel inspired by their motivation. And we are grateful for the opportunity to gather both virtually as well as in person um, to really celebrate and honor the team's hard work as they work to innovate towards impact and work towards health equity. The work that you see today was made possible by a very large and amazing community of support. So I would like to start by thanking our donors and sponsors um, whose generous support makes this program possible. Also our project clients at Texas Heart Institute, Public Invention, Nancy Harris, who is the Telesafe Director of Operations at United Concierge Medicine, and also Will Moyo, Julia Jindeswa, and Dr. Andy Gobin um, for their work to support teams as well. We also have had an amazing community of workshop collaborators who have helped our team grow professionally as well as technically this summer. I would like to thank the faculty and staff at the Oshman Engineering Design Kitchen as well as at Rice360 and especially Emily Matero, Grant Belton, and Joe Bailey, and Dr. Tracy Bowles for their extensive work coaching teams this summer. There's one final very special group of people I would like to offer a heartfelt thanks to as we begin today, and that is our team of leaders, our teaching assistants um, this summer. Let's give them a round of applause. I would like to introduce um, Majda Omer, who is a rising senior in bioengineering, Majda Wave, um, as well as medical humanities and global health technologies. Also Christian Durante, who is a rising junior in electrical engineering and engineering design. Um, Sena Mohammed, who has a recently graduated, a new alumnus um, from Rice University in social policy analysis, health sciences, and global health technologies. And also Andrew Abakalid, who recently graduated from Rice in neuroscience and global health technologies. And this amazing leadership team has really been the heartbeat and the very strong foundation for our program this summer. Um, and we are very deeply grateful for the leadership that you all have provided. And so with that, I will say again, thank you for joining us today to celebrate, to learn together, to come together and honor the group's work this summer. I will turn it over to Sina Mohammed to get us started for today. Thank you for the very warm welcome, Dr. Taylor. I would like to thank you for the amazing leadership you've shown throughout this summer. I think this has proven to be the foundation of all of the team's work. So I would love to give a round of applause to Dr. Taylor for her amazing work. And with that, I am excited to welcome the first team presenting today, team Now You V Me, Now You Don't. They have been working with international collaborators, including Will Moyo of the Malawi University of Business and Applied Sciences, Julia Jinjezwa of the Dar es Salaam Institute of Tanzania, and Dr. Andy Gobin here at Rice. Thank you, Sana. Ten percent. Prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, UNICEF estimated that only 10 percent of the 240 million masks needed in countries like Malawi and Tanzania are actually available. Only 10 percent. As you can see from this slide, a shocking percentage of, of hospitals in low resource countries lack appropriate access to face masks. Given the prevalence and longevity of the COVID-19 pandemic, this is a serious and pressing issue. However, besides increasing the risk for infection with COVID-19, lack of access to face masks also increases the risk of infection with other diseases and places an, enorm an enormous burden on the healthcare workers as a whole. Current methods which are in place to sterilize face masks include spraying with bleach or alcohol, autoclaving, or simply re-wearing the masks without disinfection at all. Not only do these methods fail to appropriately disinfect the masks for reuse, but they could lead to mass degradation over time, which causes additional health issues. Therefore, there is a need for a device which sterilizes personal protective equipment or PPE for the sake of this presentation, both efficiently and without degrading the PPE quality over time. And that is where our team comes in. Hi, we are team Now You V Me, Now You Don't. 
My name is Vanessa Garlip, and these are my teammates Abby Daus and Fadil Khan, who you can see on the screen is joining us remotely from Pakistan. We also partnered with Dr. Gobin from the Rice 360 program, as well as Julia Chenjezwa and Will Moyo from Tanzania and Malawi, respectively. Our team seeks to sterilize PPE using UVC light, which is a special shorter wavelength of UV light that is proven to have germicidal qualities. Germicidal means that if there is a surface which has viruses or bacteria dwelling on it, when it is contacted by UV light, the pathogens are inactivated on the surface, meaning that the PPE is safe for reuse. Not only is this a very efficient method of sterilization, but it also will not degrade mask quality significantly over time and decreases the need for uh, direct contact with the PPE during the sterilization process. The starting point for our design was based on the work of a previous team who developed the Steri Box, a wooden box which was able to effectively and safely sterilize masks using UV light. However, there were some problems with this device. Um, the primary one being the general so large size of the device, which caused it to have low usability, not be particularly portable, and to have a long sterilization cycle. In order to combat these issues, we developed a number of design criteria for our device to meet. First, we wanted to be able to efficiently sterilize masks, which we measured using the units of masks per time or mask per minute. We also wanted our device to be able to be powered off the grid using an independent power supply, to use materials accessible in the locations we're designing for, to be easy to operate by a single person, require low maintenance, be light and portable, and to be low cost. So now we present to you our solution, the Steri Drum. The Steri Drum is primarily based off of a 55 gallon oil drum, which is a material that's widely accessible in the locations we're designing for. Our Steri Drum rests on a wheel cart, which allows it to be mobile and has a lid stand attached to the cart, which allows to prop the lid open. When the lid is open, the lights will be turned off, which will prevent harmful UV exposure. Inside of the oil drum is a mask hanging frame, which can be slid in and out of the drum using tracks on either side. In addition, there are three UV bulbs on either side of the mask hanging frame arranged in a triangular formation, which maximizes the exposure across the entire mask frame. Here's our device in action. The lid can be opened and propped open using the stand and the mask hanging frame can be rested on the lid in order to allow for easier removal of the masks. Then the frame can easily be slid back into the, the device along the track system and the lid can be closed to start the cycle. Overall, our solution meets the majority of the design criteria we developed. We're able to efficiently sterilize masks with about 15 masks in a three minute cycle, which using the mask per minute metric is five masks per minute. This is a significant improvement over the previous team's 0.2 masks per minute. In addition, our device can be manufactured with materials available in Malawi and Tanzania. It requires low maintenance, the wheel cart makes it easily portable, and it's significantly lower cost. The two main design criteria which we can continue to work on are making the device usable with an independent power supply and testing it for usability. Overall, there are three main areas in which future work can be continued on the Steri Drum. These areas include the general design of the device, the materials the device is manufactured with, and the general usability as well as testing for the device. Overall, the Steri Drum is able to sustainably and effectively sterilize PPE while being portable and without compromising the PPE's integrity. We believe this could have a major impact on the issue of PPE shortage in low resource settings. Thank you to everybody who has helped our team get to this point, as well as to you for listening to us today. We'll now open the floor to any questions. So before we get started with questions, I'll be the mic runner for today. So if you're in person, just put up your hand and I'll try to get to as many people as we can. And if you are joining us virtually, Christian is moderating. Um, the Zoom chat so you can put your questions in the chat or rate, use the raise hand func function and we'll definitely make space for you. So yes, opening the floor to any questions. Really nice work. Um, my question is, does your device have a timer 
so that it automatically turns off once the cycle is done? And is there any way to tell from the outside that the cycle is finished? That's sort of two questions. But then the last question is, how do you know three minutes is enough? So yeah, three questions. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So for the sterilization time and a timer, we have incorporated into a circuit that we built a timer, which will cause the device to run for the amount of time we want it to, and then shut off the UV lights. And then we can tell because we attach the circuit have two lights, one being a blue and one being a red, and the blue light will light up while the cycle is in going on and while the masks are being sterilized. And then the red light, if will turn on if you open the lid in the middle of the cycle and both lights will turn off when the cycle's finished. Um, so yeah, and then. And as for the three minutes, we used, uh, did a lot of heavy research on uh, UV exposure and what would sterilize masks. And then after our research, we found a formula which we could adjust based on the distance from the light and the exposure time. And that's how we found out that given our, the diameter of our drum and everything, that three minutes was the appropriate amount of time for sterilization, so yes. <laughs> we have a question in the chat. Dr. Glow asks, how do you confirm UVC exposure to the entire mask and appropriate dose to all surfaces? Sure, so I think this was something that will be done a lot in our future work, but we, as I just mentioned, used a formula to calculate, um, approximate UV exposure and a future testing, which we would like for someone in the future to implement is to use a UV meter to measure exposure at different points to make sure that our calculations are accurate and um, yeah, close to our estimations. So I hope that helps to answer the question. <laughs> also, Danny Blacker asks, do these locations that have access to the drums have access to clean drums or are they used and need to be cleaned before used for your device? I believe that based on discussion with our international clients, there should be access to new drums at a fairly low price. So that should be a, um, should not be a problem in order to make sure that they're all standardized. Okay, and just to keep track of time, we will be moving on, but the teams do have a demo after this and you can go up to them and ask them questions. And I'm pretty sure you can also, if you're in the chat and joining us virtually connect with them through email, but thank you. Thank you to team Now You V Me, Now You Don't. We'll be moving on to team Piper. They have been working with Nancy Harris, the Telesafe Director of Operations at United Concierge Medicine in New York. Hi everyone, I'm Shivani and these are my teammates, Elise, Alex, and Shannon. And we are Team Piper, which stands for Pediatric Instructional Pelvic Examination Resource. This summer, we collaborated with our client, Nancy Harris, as Sana mentioned, to develop a pediatric pelvic model. Before we start off, we want to start out with a brief content warning. This presentation is going to contain discussion of pediatric sexual assault and abuse, so if you ever need to take a moment for yourself during the presentation, please feel free to do so. The prevalence of pediatric sexual abuse is a pressing issue. About one in four girls and one in 13 boys at some point during childhood will be exposed to sexual assault. And this can have a series of consequences, including physical injuries, sexually transmitted infections, adverse mental health outcomes, and even an increased risk of re-victimization in adulthood. The severity of this issue necessitates the availability of well-trained clinicians who can provide care to survivors. When it's suspected that a child has been sexually assaulted, providers have a thorough protocol to follow to ensure the child's well-being, a key component of which is the pediatric pelvic exam. This exam is conducted in two positions, supine and prone, and in each position, the labia is separated so that the hymen can be viewed and assessed for any potential abnormalities or injuries. It's conducted in both positions as the hymen tends to move slightly and appear different in each position. It's highly important due to the sensitivity of this exam that the providers are very well-trained. 
Due to the limited number of current providers in this area, it's imperative to have an efficient and effective training program. However, currently, pediatric sexual assault examiners are solely trained through instructional training and approximately 50 exam observations, as there's currently no hands-on existing training model. And a hands-on model would be highly effective in um, increasing the comfort of these providers in conducting exams on their own more quickly. Therefore, our team seeks a way to facilitate model-based hands-on training for pediatric sexual assault examiners in order to improve their comfort levels and training efficiency. So our model is the first ever uh, model of a pediatric public exam. And when we, when we sat down to do our model, we wanted to accomplish three things. One, we wanted to be able to do the labial traction, um, like Elise talked about earlier for the public exam. Two, we wanted to be able to rotate between the supine and prone positions. And three, we also wanted to be able to switch out the hymens so that the uh, nurses could get used to a variety of different hymens, shapes, and sizes. Um, so as you see here, the cylinder represents the pelvis. The hymen and labia are on a cap attached to the cylinder, and the rotation mechanism is contained on the dowel that goes through the cylinder and the base. So on this slide, we have some pictures of our uh, zoomed in pictures of the hymen. Um, so we got in contact with an OBGYN, and she kind of directed us towards uh, material for this. It's a silicone rubber called Ecoflex 30, and we molded it, and you can see on the right a zoomed in picture of the labial traction happening where you can see what the effect it has on the hymen. So here's a video of the demonstration of our product. Okay. Uh, let's try that again. Okay, here we go. So we have the hymen and labia on the cap and it fits right into the cylinder. And you can see there's the screw cap that goes on on top, almost like the lid of a mason jar. So it secures it in place. You can then perform the traction on it and view the hymen to see if any damage has occurred. You then use the, the dowel to do the rotation to the prone position and flip around the model so it's facing you. And then you can do the traction again to see if anything changed with the hymen from the supine position to the prone position. Team Piper has accomplished many of our goals for this summer. We now have a functional model that properly rotates from the supine to the prone position. According to a local gynecologist, the labia on our model provides a very accurate tactile experience. Labial traction can also be performed and the hymen moves appropriately during this traction. With that being said, there are a number of future steps we would like to take. The main next step for Piper is user testing. We will be sending our model and testing plan to our client so she can gather user feedback on it during a training in early August. We also need to look into sanitization. We ran into some issues with isopropyl alcohol degrading our acrylic base, so further materials research is needed to find a material that will not be affected by any alcohol-based cleaning supplies that hospitals may use. We also need to finalize and standardize our labia and hymen attachment and molding process for further production of these models. And finally, our hymen does not move properly when the model is rotated from supine to prone, so further iteration is required to perfect this motion. Overall, Team Piper is very proud of the progress we have made this summer. We anticipate our model increasing the availability of trained pelvic examiners and ultimately improving care for pediatric sexual assault survivors. Thank you, and we will now open the floor for questions. Thank you. What an excellent project and presentation you have given. Um, my question for you is, can you explain a little bit more about the hymen movement and what do you actually need to move forward into um, achieving that, that uh, objective? Yeah, I can take this one. So when the child is examined in the supine position, the hymen will be sitting in a certain way. And then when the child um, rotates to prone, which is on their knees, gravity can cause the hymen to fall differently. And so any abnormalities in the supine position need to be verified in the prone position to know whether or not it's indicative of abuse, because it could have just been how the hymen was um, sitting in the supine position. So essentially our model, we need a material that kind of accomplishes that gravitational change when the model is rotated from supine to prone.
Fantastic work. Um, this is more of a comment, perhaps. Um, you mentioned wanting to get a material that would adjust when you change it or will be flexible with gravity. Um, would there be a possibility instead to create kind of pairs of models so that you could put one on each side, for example, and, and the examiner could turn it? Um, and that way you might not have to have a material that actually changes position. So that, that may be one idea at least. Um, and maybe mix and match the pairs. Uh, and that might be an interesting way of, of having different um, iterations of the model so that an examiner could look at something that's normal, something that's not normal, um, something that maybe is, you know, is nebulous. Probably they'd like to see all of those things um, in their model. Yeah, thank you so much. We can look into that in the future. Awesome, if there are no more questions. Thank you, Team Piper. Thank you, Team Piper. With that, I would like to introduce the next team, Team Petrify. They have been working with Dr. Robert Reed of Public Invention based in Austin, Texas. Hi everyone, my name is Teja Paturu and along with my teammates, Sarah, Nancy, and Kenton, we are Team Petrify. 3.4 million global deaths occurred due to waterborne illness in 2019. In order to predict and prevent these deadly outbreaks, we want to achieve environmental surveillance of community water sources for E. coli contamination. E. coli is a predictor for waterborne illness. E. coli is a good assessment of whether or not your water is fecally contaminated. Fecally contaminated water is usually what causes waterborne illness. So the presence of E. coli itself isn't necessarily toxic to humans, but it implies that there are more toxic pathogens in your water, such as V. cholerae or S. typhi, which cause uh, cholera and typhoid respectively. There we go. <laughs> Petrofilms hold water samples for incubation. They're essentially just a petri dish, but in paper form. So first you go and collect your water sample. So my teammate Kenton here biked over to the bayou and grabbed a bottle of the water. Uh, next, you, oops, next you put a milliliter of this water on this petrofilm here and you close it and incubate it at body temperature for 24 to 48 hours, after which you can pull it out and see a result like this. So let's take a closer look at this result. As you can see, there is a lot going on on this petrofilm, but what's important is these indigo dots. These indigo dots represent E. coli. So when they are placed on this plate, they go through a chemical reaction that produces this indigo color. So the needs of our device are that the sample should be preserved. So once you remove water from a water source, it won't be viable for testing for after 24 hours because the individual bacteria in the tube will begin to die with exposure to sunlight. Next, we want our device to be easy to travel with. So laboratories are pretty inaccessible in low resource settings um, due to distance or just uh, resource resources. Um, and finally, we wanted our device to be independently powered because uh, low resource settings often have unreliable power grids. To summarize, Team Petrify is developing a portable incubator to culture E. coli to detect fecal contamination in water samples in low resource settings. So here's our device, Team Petrify's field incubator. On the top, we have an electronics chamber, and on the bottom, we have an insulated heating chamber, all encapsulated in a two-chamber laser-cut wooden box. To use this device, first, you'll take out the Petrofilm holder, which is that shelf on the bottom, and then you'll put the Petrofilms in, up to 20 at a time, put it in, you'll close the door, and then you'll go up to the top of the box where we have a user interface. We have a screen and we have three different buttons, an up, down, and okay. And then you can set the temperature and time, and then you can start heating with the okay button. Now 
let's talk about some key features of our device. First, our device is portable. It fits into the uh, standard size backpack, which is useful for researchers who are out in the field. It is also much smaller than a commercial portable incubator, which is the device that you see on the right. Also, our device has a long battery life. After completing heat loss testing, we found that using two 12 volt batteries is enough to power our device for the entire 48 hours of the incubation cycle. Also, our device is open source. All of our code is uploaded to GitHub, and we also use easily accessible and inexpensive materials, such as an Arduino and also a lot of plywood in order to create this design. To prove the effectiveness of our device, we took the water sample that was previously mentioned from Kenton, and we took half of the samples into a commercial incubator and half into our own device. What we found was that these two samples look pretty similar, which means that our device is effective at producing the same results as a commercial incubator. While we've seen some promising results so far, we have a few next steps we've identified. First, we'd like to upgrade our code to have a more robust user interface and add some more features. We'd also like to improve the casing in order to make it more waterproof. And we'd also like to expand applications. Right now, our device is suited for E. coli testing, but we believe that we can, we can address other issues such as strep throat tests or biopsy samples. We'd like to thank our client, Dr. Reed, as well as everyone who has helped us in our, pro our journey through this internship. And now we'd like to open for questions. Can you explain on the on the bottom of your picture there, there's like a purple material. Can you explain what that is and what it's used for? Um, yes, that is insulating foam. I believe it's polyiso. So what we did was we we made the chamber just completely like on all sides, including the door, which is not seen in the picture, covered in that foam, and that prevents heat loss. Can you talk a little more about um, what your client is hoping to do with this product? Yeah, I can take this one. So the original conception of this project was that a organization called Engineers Without Borders was going to low resource communities abroad and building wells for these communities to access clean water. And there was no way to test if the water was contaminated or safe to drink. So they would employ like sanitation methods, which were possibly wasteful and not necessarily targeted to the exact kind of contamination present. So our, um, our, our client, I guess, uh, thought of this project to make that more accessible, but also there's a wide range of applications for water testing. So. We have a question over Zoom from Dr. Glow. How do you prevent cross-contamination between samples? Sure, so the... Uh, the testing process requires a lot of sterilization because if you are using the same pipette, say, to collect water samples from one source to another, you might be mixing the contamination. So in general, there are very cheaply available pre-sterilized uh, pasteur pipettes, which come in plastic packaging. Uh, so yeah, that was some, that's something that field researchers are usually familiar with. Can your device, oh, sorry, uh, Patrick asks, can your device be adapted to automatically and periodically collect and test water samples from a water source like a pipe? Yes, not at the moment, um, but uh, our device, we do hope to implement more um, usability for our device. Right now it does require the use of petrofilms. So water samples are put onto petrofilms, which are like small Petri dishes um, and uh, samples can, or the device can hold up to 20 petrofilms during an incubation. So 
although it can't uh, currently use something like a pipe, um, it can be used to collect multiple samples at different times and also uh, get a small snapshot of each one. Thank you, Team Petrify. Thank you. Thank you, Team Petrify. Next up, I'd like to introduce Team Breathe Easy. They have also been working in collaboration with Dr. Robert Reed of Public Invention. I want you to imagine something. You're an EMT, you're on call this evening. You get a call at 11 p.m., person with respiratory distress. You arrive on the scene, there's a chaotic environment. People are yelling, asking what's wrong, worried about their friends, asking you how they can help. You clear the scene, you get to the patient, and you notice they're unconscious, they're not breathing. You immediately start assembling a BVM, which is a bag valve mask, and you start your pumps to help facilitate, facilitate resuscitation because you know in three minutes without air can cause brain damage. Now a task as simple as squeezing a bag may sound simple, but there's so many things that can go wrong. If you squeeze at the wrong rate, you have a risk of increased intracranial pressure. If you squeeze too much air into the patient, you have a chance for blocked airways caused by vomiting because the air goes directly to the stomach and not to the lungs. If you squeeze not enough air into your patient, you have a chance for cerebral hypoxia, not enough air to the brain. And that does indeed sound stressful. And so in case anyone didn't know, because uh, we certainly did not, a BVM is a bag valve mask, which consists of three simple parts, a bag, a valve, and a mask. And as you can see here in the video, this is how it is being operated. It's being used for general ventilation of unconscious patients so they can be moved to uh, higher fidelity care in hospitals. Um, the problem is that despite being such a commonly used instrument, uh, on average, almost 92% of ventilation goes wrong in some kind of way, whether it be too much air, too little, not at the right rate. And so we're team Breathe Easy. My name is Matthew and I'm presenting with Chinwe and along with my colleagues, Alois and Alvin, we are looking to solve this problem. Now we want to create a device that reduces the amount of errors in bag valve mask usage with the aid of real time visual and audio feedback to assist you in ventilation so that you're delivering the correct amount of air to the patient along with the right rate because that is also important. Our solution is the BVM monitor. As you can see here, this green device is our, is our enclosure which holds electronics which has a flow sensor, which reads the amount of air you're pumping from the bag into the patient. Now from the flow sensor, it will output through the code, a interface that allow you to see in real time if you're pumping too much air at the wrong rate and give you feedback so you can get the ventilation right every time. Another big part of this was also looking into user feedback and user interfaces. And so we worked extensively with partners in REMS to get the right user interface so that they could work well with this product so it'd be easy and intuitive to them. And to talk about that, I'd like to pass it off to Chinwe. Thank you, Matthew, for the fantastic transition. So as you can see here, these are the three user interfaces that we developed in partnership with REMS and also with the help of Jake Johnston, a usability expert. We wanna reiterate that it's very important that the device is very intuitive quickly, easy to understand how to use it and understand the feedback that they are receiving. After some usability testing with REMS in particular, we were able to narrow the screen to this screen. Additionally, we also refined the audio according to medical standards. Again, we got REMS and Jake's expertise on what they would like on the user interface. So we have a squeeze tone that goes off every time the person needs to squeeze the bag. In addition, we have an emergency alarm that goes off 
after three consecutive dangerous squeezes to direct the user's attention back to the monitor. And additionally, we also have an alarm off button. This is a medical standard due to alarm fatigue and also something that Rice EMS suggested would be nice to have. Finally, we have a toggle that adjusts the amount of volume that the patient needs according to their height. So what's next? We have our device and we have the user interface. We are going to combine the two together and conduct usability assessments on the system as a whole. And from there, we will be ready for clinical trials. So with our BVM monitor, both the patient and the healthcare provider will be able to breathe easy. We want to thank you guys for listening to our presentation. Special thanks to Robert Reed of Public Invention, along with the ODK, Rice360, and Rice EMS. And we invite you guys to come to our booth to interact with our device and our interfaces. So at the moment, a uh, question as far as the um, interface goes, do you have any way of detecting whether or not the seal is on the patient at this point? Uh, so you have volume tracking, but uh, do you have any means of testing whether or not you know, there's been a good seal? So you know, is, if there's a lot of leaking air or something like that, is that has that been addressed at all? Uh, we actually don't have a, something that indicates if the seal was made. We put it to like the, the person who was actually performing the back valve mask uh, that for them to for them to clear, clear that seal. So we make the device not to be in the way so that they can see the mask. So that was one of the, our criteria to make sure that it was actually visible. But indicating if the seal will be there or not, no. We have a, the the what the device is really doing is just taking the flow, the airflow that comes in. So if it's not a good seal and you're not getting an, enough enough flow of, of air pressure, then you would actually, it would show that you're not putting the correct thing. So the feedback that we are, we would have would let you be able to check if you are and then you would have to adjust to such things. But that's something that definitely could be put in the future works. And then to add on to that, one of the features that we hope to implement is that alarm off function. And the reason that REMS spoke about the alarm off function was because of the seal. Uh, and they indicated that in situations, sometimes the seal isn't always correct. So they have to over pump or overcompensate in their pumping. And so having the alarm go off when they know that they're pumping the correct amount because there's an incorrect seal is something they wanted to let, have us look into. Would the bag uh, valve mask be purchased with your monitor on it, or is it something where they would need to add it while they're triaging everything else happening? So the entire device is disassembled when they're transporting it. So it'd be something that is in the bag of the EMS and maybe further talks. If we want to make this a business thing, we can have it pre-installed to the Ambu bags, but that's, it's already disassembled, so they would have to assemble it. And we've also conducted user testing on whether it's intuitive to assemble the device, which is a key part. Great job, um, guys. I really enjoyed your presentation. Um, my question for you is this. You've, you spoke about alarm fatigue. In a stressful environment, especially if there is an ambulance um, present, it is really loud. Have you thought about a different way to alarm, such as like a haptic alert system versus a noise system? Um, because the idea of trying to hear the alarms of your system and have that feedback, but not necessarily, I know the focus is on the patient, but it's really loud. <laughs> yeah, um, so we did our research in our device. You can actually interact with it without the audio because it guides you the way you should squeeze and the rate, because there's a line that goes up and you're supposed to follow that line. So you can definitely do everything without the sound. 
and also like you can also decide to like switch it on and off and what we did with the tone uh, of course they said because we are in the ambulance um the tone has to sound different so we actually had to research a specific frequency that we use that is different from the frequency that is in the ambulance usually We have a question from Zoom, in Zoom from Danny. Is the size or age of the patient a factor when determining the correct amount of air volume to deliver? Yeah, so the volume depends only on the height. So five to six feet is usually the height of most people. It ranges from 462, which is the lower limit, and 650, which is the upper limit. But if you are like four to five feet, the volume is lower. And then we also have a toggle that allows the user to adjust according to the patient's height, which corresponds to the amount of volume that they need. Thank you, Team Breathe Easy. Thank you, Team Breathe Easy. I would like to now introduce the last team presenting today, Team Heartache. They have been working in collaboration with a team at the Texas Heart Institute. Hello everyone, and thank you for coming here today. My name is Caitlin and my teammates are Rachel, Chris, and Sam, and we are Team Heartache. We, today we will be talking about how we spent this summer developing a lung heart motion model. So we have been working with the Texas Heart Institute, more specifically a team from the Electrophysiology Clinical Research and Innovations Department. Through this collaboration, we have been developing a lung heart motion model that would assist in the practicing and testing of catheter ablations as well as other medical devices. A, cath um, a catheter ablation is used to treat heart arrhythmias or irregular heartbeats. A catheter is a long, flexible tube that is threaded through narrow openings in the body. In this case, the catheter is inserted into a blood vessel and thread up into the heart. Once it is in, in the heart, it is used to terminate irregular um, electrical pathways by um, burning irregular um, cardiac cells. So here's a video that shows the normal physiological motion of both the heart and lungs. So this is the current setup that has been developed by the Texas Heart Institute for the practicing of um, catheter ablations as well as other various medical devices. Um, a limitation to this current device is the fact that it doesn't incorporate the heart and lung motion. It has the heart tissue just staying in one spot at all times, which is not the it, which doesn't best resemble the actual environment in which catheter ablations are typically performed. Therefore, we were tasked with designing a setup that mimics the cumulative motion of the heart and lungs to allow for the testing and practicing of catheter ablations. We plan to do so by incorporating and combining the sine waves of both the heart and lungs. As you can see on this slide, the lungs have the higher amplitude but a lower frequency, while the heart has a higher frequency but a lower amplitude. The combined sign function is shown on the right of the slide where there's the um, picture including both the heart and lungs. So to do this in our model, we plan to have the tissue table to which the cardiac tissue would be attached moving up and down in this combined sign function. It would end up looking something like this. There are three categories of constraints that we had to consider when designing our prototype. The first of which was the fact that it had to incorporate both the lung motion and the heart motion. The next constraint um, was more contribute to the fact that it had to maintain the level of physiological accuracy that we wanted the setup to have. And then lastly, it had to be able to interface with the current setup, which had a particular height range. Now I will be passing it on to Rachel for her to discuss our team solution. Given the problem context and our constraints, our solution will be implementing a gear and rack system. A gear will be attached to a rack and as the gear turns, the rack will be able to pull the tissue platform up. The rotational motion of the gear would allow us to translate 
into the vertical linear motion of the tissue platform. Using this method allows us to have a controlled and adjustable motion within the saline environment. There are three main components of our prototype that I'll be going into. So the first component is what we call the hanging servo box. This hanging servo box has a rod attachment, which allows the box to be attached to the metal rod that runs across the top of the tank setup. Additionally, there's a compartment within the box that would hold a servo motor onto which we can attach a gear. And finally, there's a notch that protrudes from the front of the box onto which we could attach a rack that would interlock with the gear and would be able to be pulled up when the gear is turned. And this first gear will be turning at a rate that is representative of the lung motion. Our second component is what we call the intermediate servo box. This servo box has three main components, the rack on the right side of the box, another compartment that holds the second servo motor, and another notch that protrudes from the surface of the box. So the rack on the right side of the box will slip onto the notch of the first hanging servo box. This rack will then interface with the first gear and will be pull, pulling up the entire box up and down um, in a way that is representing the lung motion. Additionally, a gear can attach to the second servo box and will turn at the rate that is representative of the heart motion. And the notch will allow an additional rack to be attached to that second gear in order to be pulled up. And finally, the third component is a revamped version of the original tissue platform. Um, with the, um, like the original tissue platform, it will sit on top of that, uh, will sit on top of a red platform that is already inside the tank and will have two arms that extend upwards on the sides. At the end of the arms, there will be a rack that can attach to the notch of the intermediate servo box. This allows for the entire tissue platform to be moved up and down in a way that's representative of the heart motion, while the first hanging servo box will pull up the entire system in a way that is representative of the lung motion. This allows us to model the cumulative motion of both the lung and heart. For our next steps, we will be working to test our device in person at the Texas Heart Institute while interfacing with their current setup. We will also be working to minimize our footprint by trying to make our device smaller and to, in order to ease setup and reduce the airspace that we take up um, above the tank. And finally, we will work to improve the user interface so that we can make it easier for users to adjust the heart and lung motion. And finally, we'd, we would like to thank the Texas Heart Institute and to everyone else who made this program possible um, during the summer. Thank you so much for listening to our presentation and we would like to open the floor to any questions. Um, I, I wanted to ask, I see both your, your gear boxes are suspended midair. Where did you encounter any difficulties with the weight of components or what did that ever become an issue? Um, so the, sorry, Matthew, can't see you. So the weight of the components were never really an issue, but we did encounter some trouble when it comes to making sure that the hanging boxes don't tilt. Uh, and that when the racks are attached, that they stay vertical. So um, in order to mitigate that, we worked on creating these little, um, I guess we would call them caps that would attach to the end of the notches once the racks are slipped in. That would keep the racks vertical and prevent them from tilting. Very interesting problem to solve. Um, I wondered if one of your constraints, is it your design is very uh, one dimensional? Is that a constraint of what you are designing to or is there hopes to move this into something that could be more three dimensional representation? Um, so part of our problem is that um, we got this from our uh, Texas Heart Institute and they 
understood that due to the complexity of this problem, um, we we're kind of limited as to what we could achieve within the scope of our six weeks. And so for us, we set out with the goal of mimicking the motion through vertical movement. Um, so what we did was do some research and to work out what the displacements should be for the heart and the lungs and how we could implement both to make it as realistic as possible. But as to more like a three-dimensional motion, uh, that was not within the scope of our six weeks. Um, but we do think that would be a very interesting and difficult problem to take on. I do have a comment from Zoom from uh, Dr. Rob Reed. He says, it seems like that this could also be done with a more powerful servo motor and sort of programming it with like the single like superimposed sign motion. And he likes that you have a good plan to sort of compromise. I know you guys have a comment on that. Yeah end of prototyping? Um, yeah, we had initially tried that approach, but we had reached some problems around the way. So we decided to move back to the two solver approach and leave the combined um, sine wave for a future, um, uh, in the future scope. Thank you, Team Hardig. Thank you, Team Hardick, and thank you to all of the teams for presenting today. We want to give a huge congratulations to you for your wonderful presentations and the wonderful work you've been doing throughout the summer. Um, this concludes the first portion of our showcase and the virtual portion of our showcase. However, we invite anyone here in person in Houston to join us around the corner at the BRC event hall so that the teams can show you their projects in person, answer any questions that you might have. Um, with that, we would like to conclude this portion of the showcase. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for your time and effort and take care.